Are we live? Are we starting? Okay. Hello, I'm Sean Means, reporter and assistant editor at the Salt Lake Tribune. Welcome to our Facebook Live conversation with Dr. Angela Dunn, state epidemiologist for the Utah Department of Health. Dr. Dunn, thank you for taking some time to be with us today. Yeah, happy to be here, Sean. Well, good. Uh, we put the call out to Tribune readers to send us questions to ask you, Dr. Dunn, about the COVID-19 pandemic, about the vaccine rollout, about testing, and whatever else they wanted to ask about the coronavirus. And they responded. We received around 90 uh, questions from readers, most of them falling within a few main categories. And we're going to try to jump in and tackle as many as we can. Um, first off, let's, let's talk about teachers, since uh, they're the next group in line to get the vaccine this week. Uh, Governor Spencer Cox surprised a lot of people last week when he announced the teachers would, be start, would start getting vaccines as soon as this week. And we've seen it happen. Yesterday, there was a mass vaccination event in Davis County where a lot of teachers got their shots, and we're expecting to see a lot more in the next few days. Uh, can you describe the process from the public health side of things that led to the speeding up of the schedule that Governor Cox ordered last week? Sure. So with any vaccine distribution schedule, it depends on how much vaccine we get. And our federal partners um, are able to allocate us however much um, you know, they're getting from the manufacturers and they're distributing it to states. So it's really interesting that we're, we're kind of in this flux and on a week to week basis, we understand um, how much we're getting from our federal partners. And so that has an impact on who we're able to vaccinate. The other piece that added into the speeding up of of teachers being vaccinated is the uptake of our healthcare providers um, and that kind of really early group of the frontline healthcare providers and our healthcare workers caring for patients um, in person. Uh, we had leftover doses basically. And so we were able to speed up our timeline for who gets vaccinated. Okay. Uh, our first reader question is from Maggie Nickerson, who uh, works at an elementary school in Salt Lake City. She asks, um, if I'm vaccinated, what protection does this offer my family? If I'm exposed to COVID-19, can I expose my family? Right. So what we know about vaccines, about the COVID vaccine, specifically for Pfizer and Moderna, is that it prevents an individual from getting sick if they're exposed to COVID. What we don't know yet is if it prevents you from transmitting it if you don't have any symptoms. Um, and the reason we don't know that is because time was of the essence in getting a vaccine out. And so the trials really focused on preventing illness. Um, and now there are studies going on to determine if the vaccine actually prevents you from being able to transmit COVID after you've been vaccinated, even if you don't have any symptoms. So that's why it's just so important. We still recommend individuals continue to wear face masks and physical distance as much as they can, not only because we need it to be the social norm until we reach 70 to 80% of our population being vaccinated, but also that there is a small chance that, you know, the vaccine might not be as good at preventing transmission. Okay, and that, and that, and that also speaks, uh, you talk about like the, the people who were in the first trials, they are, they are continuing to be the, 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 the trailblazers here in, the, in that the quiet questions we don't know, like how long this is going to work, how long this is going to stay effective. Uh, it's basically however long they've got, they're, they're still okay, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the FDA, because we needed this vaccine so quickly, followed them for two months before getting an EUA. So we know that the immunity is great for two months and even longer now that we're following these individuals who are in the trial. So we'll continuously get new information and, and relay it to the public as we get it. Okay, so uh, Maggie also worries about having to go back to school before the vaccines are you know, widely available. How worried should she be about possible transmission from asymptomatic students? Sure. So, you know, we've done a lot of research into this in the state of Utah using our data here. And what we found in elementary schools is that it's actually, you know, there's a really low rate of transmission between students and teachers and even between students themselves when everybody's wearing a mask in an elementary school setting. That risk increases as you get to middle school and definitely increases as you get to high school. But we do know that wearing masks in the school setting does prevent that transmission. So it's really important that everybody continue to be safe outside of the school setting um, so that they're of course not bringing it in, but then when they're in the school setting, adhering to the mask, um, and adhering to mask wearing will be really important to keep everyone safe. 
Okay. Um, now, now there was another announcement that the Governor Cox made last week, and he put he's putting the responsibility for getting the vaccine out to the people into the hands of of uh, the county and regional uh, mm -hmm. health departments. Um, how how is that going to streamline the process? Uh, we are very excited for this point. Um, our local health departments. This is what they do best. They do mass vaccination clinics. We are prepared for that at the local level and they've already proven it. I mean, as you mentioned, Davis already has a mass vaccination clinic set up and, and they successfully are getting a lot of people through it. And we're talking about mass vaccination. We're talking about thousands of people being vaccinated every single day through these sites. So what we need to do is get more vaccine to our local health departments so that they can get the shots in arms. Um, but this is what our local health departments do best. We're set up for this. Okay. Um, I, we're going to get to more about that in a second. I want to get to a couple more teacher questions. Um, we've got a very specific question from one teacher, Michael Mills, um, that, uh, okay, he, he teaches in a 32 person computer lab in a building that's only five years old. It's got good air exchange, plexiglass around his desk and a UV killing air exchanger next to the desk. His question is how long after students leave the classroom should he wait to remove his N95 fill, uh, mask? Well, and, this, sure and, this, and this and this and this is and this goes to sort of a bigger question that people worry about is is how much the vaccine or how much the virus lingers in the air after nobody's around breathing it again. Exactly. And I mean, I'm sure some other teachers and educators out there are jealous by all of um, the swag he has to protect yeah. himself. So that's really, really great. Um, and, you know, what we've learned throughout this pandemic is that the virus actually doesn't really um, transmit that easily from objects. Um, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, it's still good to wash our hands and to clean regularly, but we don't have to be wiping down our groceries and things like that. With regards to air, um, you know, it, it doesn't seem to linger that long in the air either, but to be safe, you know, a couple hours is probably safe, but it does seem to circulate as long as, you know, what he's describing is he has good air circulation and ventilation. Mm -hmm. That means that the air is circulating really quickly. So it is probably a matter of minutes for his situation because of okay. that good air circulation. And then another question from, uh, this is from Michael Sibbett. Uh, he owns a private Montessori school. He says 80% of his teachers either are signing up for the vaccine or they've already had COVID. Um, and, he, and what he wants to know is what he should say to the other 20% who are anti-vaccine and, and, and are saying they're not gonna get the vaccine. Yeah, and you know, that's fine. Um, we're not here to force people to get vaccinated. What we need is the vast majority of people who can get vaccinated to get vaccinated. And those who choose not to take the vaccine need to be extra cautious in terms of physical distancing and mask wearing to protect themselves and those vulnerable populations who may not be eligible for the vaccine. So those who don't get vaccinated really pay more close attention to your symptoms, stay home if you're a close contact to anybody who has COVID and stay home if you have the most minor symptoms at all. Okay, um, now let's talk about the, the next group of people that, uh, that, that are, start, are gonna start getting the vaccine as soon as next week is uh, people who are 70 and over, uh, was what the governor announced last week, uh, starting on the 18th. And, and several readers have asked about this, is what procedures are being set up for those who are 70 or older, uh, 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 to, to, to sign up and get the vaccine? Well, a lot of our local health departments actually started sign up today. And I will tell mm. you the demand is off the charts. Um, some of the ways to actually get scheduled have crashed because so many people are trying to get scheduled. So it's a mixture of phone call and web. Um, a lot of our uh, messaging has been to the, the kids of the, of the older adults so that they can help their their um, parents get set up. We also have our hotline. So our coronavirus hotline um, has the ability, if somebody wants, they can call in and they can get registered through the hotline as well. Um, so right now we're doing a mixture of web and phone calls. We'll monitor the uptake and then make sure we reach those who are unable to do both those by doing more proactive outreach. Okay, now as, as we pointed out, uh, uh, doesn't always go so smoothly. I mean, the website for Salt Lake County's health department crashed this morning. Uh, what uh, what, do you, what do you recommend in those instances? Uh, we had one reader, Jen Kios, asking, she, she, she had her 80 year old mother uh, trying to get her set up this morning, complete disaster. Uh, and she wonders if like Intermountain Healthcare or the University of Utah Health or somebody with, with infrastructure like that would be better suited to do this than, than, than the county health department. 
Yeah, so I think it's a really good sign that there's so much demand among our older adults to get vaccinated. Um, I will say again, our local health departments are well equipped for mass vaccination um, and are working with our healthcare system partners to make sure that that is fluid. Um, for people who are having struggle trouble signing up today, I would say don't panic. It's okay to sign up tomorrow or the next day. You will get a vaccine um, and a few days or a few weeks um, won't make a huge difference. We have a vaccine for you. So I would just relax for today and, and call again tomorrow when the systems are back up and running. Okay. Um, somebody, Joseph Haber, one of our readers suggested, uh, uh, we whether, asked if we could use the uh, state's cannabis registry as a vaccination resource, since most of those are people who have serious health problems. That is a great idea for proactive outreach. I hadn't thought about that, um, but I'll bring that up to, to our staff. Okay, all righty. Um, now, and, and then, let me ask you this, because the, the recommendation came down yesterday from the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, for the, from the CDC, uh, that, that 65 and older was, was the sort of the good cutoff for everybody 65 and older should get, should get uh, the vaccine as soon as possible. Uh, is there any talk about uh, dropping the, se the 70 limit that the governor announced last week, dropping that to 65 since we're heading there anyway? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that did come as kind of a surprise for every state because up until yesterday, the federal government had been resisting opening it up. Um, and again, this is a supply demand um, equation here. And what we know in Utah is that we have enough supply to vaccinate the 70 plus population through the end of February. And we're looking at our supply and our populations in the other age groups to see how quickly we can start opening it up. So that is, that is on the top of everyone's mind right now. Okay, um, let me ask you this. The, uh, the issue, um, uh, it's come up and we've heard that uh, places that have leftover stock, and you mentioned how, how some people have leftover doses, that the state has been able to go in and sort of grab those and, and, and reallocate. How, how has that worked? How, how, how does that system work out? Yeah, so it's um, a collaboration between our local health departments and the hospitals that have extra doses. Um, and we have a cold chain process that makes sure that logistically the vaccine is safe and stored at the appropriate temperature the whole time. And um, the local health department can procure these extra doses from the health care systems to incorporate into their mass vaccination clinics. Um, so it's just great. We have such a good collaborative um, community here between the locals and the health systems. Okay. Um, a couple of our readers want to know about how they would get notified when it was their turn. Uh, Joanne McQueen, who's 75, wants to know when it's time to get notified. Uh, Jen Farrell asked, uh, she's got an elderly mom who lives with her, wants to know, you know, when it's going to be her turn. Um, I, for, for 70 and over, the, the answer is now, right? I mean, <laughs> Correct. Yep, absolutely. You can contact your local health department and they're starting to take appointments um, okay. to book those for who are 70 and up. What, what's the plan down the road when, when we're going for the 65 and up, when we're going for the, the, the people in the tribal communities, the minority and ethnic communities, what's the, what's the plan? What's the, what's the outreach going to be as far as getting the word out to those groups that it's going to be time to go get their right. shots? So I would say first in general, if you go to our coronavirus.utah.gov backslash vaccine website, you can sign up for a weekly email in Spanish or English. That'll help you. Of course, we're going to work with our media partners to get the word out. But then for specific communities, we, we are going to use our community health worker infrastructure that we already have. And we've been using it for testing, quarantine, and isolation. And now we're going to add on vaccination as well. Um, so looking for leaders that are already um, embedded within populations that are hard to reach and making sure that everyone gets the information they need. Okay. Uh, one of our readers, uh, Patricia Cra uh, Crafton, uh, said she was frustrated that her primary care physician didn't uh, have enough information about when she and her husband should get vaccinated. What are, what are, what's, what's the Utah Health Department and what, is this, what are the local health departments, what are they doing to communicate uh, information to physicians? Yeah, we um, are building our physician work group and the communication channels apart from the channels I just mentioned to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to get the information. I will say when it comes to vaccine, especially with Pfizer and Moderna, the two that are out right now, because they have such specific storage requirements um, and we need to get it out very efficiently, the best information you can get is going to be from the state health department or your local health department website. Um, they're the ones with the vaccine and they're the ones with the information about when you can get it. Okay, what's the, what's the timeline for, I mean, the Oxford Ast AstraZeneca is, is mm -hmm. 
been approved in the UK. It hasn't been approved in the States yet. Uh, what's Do we have a timeline on when that one's going to be possibly available? Well, for both the Johnson & Johnson vaccine That's and the, the AstraZeneca, one, yeah. um, we're, I'm hearing that it could be somewhere in, in the February timeframe. So mm. definitely in the early spring, it seems like we will have more options for vaccination, which is fantastic. Okay, that's excellent. Um, switching gear slightly to the topic of pre-existing conditions and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, underlying conditions, because uh, they 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 are sort of at least in in lists, lists we've had they're sort of the next ones on deck after the, after the seventy and up. Uh, we've got here uh, Erica Lofting asks if obesity is a criteria. Jay Garlic asks about type two diabetes. Uh, Kathy Gagon said her husband is over seventy and has COPD. Uh, should they should they get the shot ahead of a, a healthy person? Um, so obesity, diabetes, COPD, where do those fall in sort of the criteria list for underlying conditions? Absolutely. So what we know is that 65 plus, regardless of underlying conditions, is at the highest risk for severe disease. And then younger than that, like you said, we start looking at high risk conditions. Those include everything you mentioned. We've got obesity, COPD, heart disease, um, diabetes is in there. So um, what's really important for us is to look at our population and make sure we have enough vaccine to cover those with high risk conditions. And we're currently looking at those numbers and detailing that out now. Again, it's gonna be a combination of age and high risk condition because that's how you get the people who are at highest risk for severe disease. Okay. Um, we have one of our readers, Laura Lee Choet, uh, talked about how she's she had COVID back in July. Kevin Sisney uh, said he's he's had the virus. So you do. What's what's the deal? If you if you've already had COVID, do you need the virus, or, or do, do you need the vaccine? Sorry, yeah. D words. So we know that somebody who's been infected with COVID can assume they have immunity for ninety days after they've recovered from COVID. Hmm. So we don't recommend that people get the vaccine within those ninety days. You can. But again, we have limited supply, so it's better to wait until after your 90 days of immunity to get the vaccine. Um, but we definitely want you to get the vaccine if you've had COVID, because that's how you'll get more long-term and more robust immunity and protection. Okay, because that I mean, I'm, I remember in, in in the governor's press conference last week, he talked about how 90 days if, you, if you've had it within 90 days, you probably shouldn't get the vaccine. He would rather he would like it to see see it be six months, but 90 days is sort of the rule at the moment. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Um, Joel Kuros, he wrote that he's 26 and he doesn't have any underlying conditions, but he's considered obese. And you get in now you get into the 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 the, the apples and oranges of it all, where you've got somebody who's young but they've got a comorbidity. Mm -hmm. How I mean, how how do you how do you balance those out when when it comes time yeah. to do the? Absolutely. The, when we look at um, at our information in the outbreak here in Utah. What we see is that the highest risk for hospitalization with these high risk conditions with the comorbidities really starts at the age of 45. Um, so it seems like your age really does protect you against getting severe disease. Um, so when we have such a limited supply of vaccine, we're going to be looking at kind of older adults, um, those age, you know, kind of middle aged adults with comorbid conditions and moving from there. Our younger populations, fortunately, just aren't seeing the burden of severe disease, and so likely they will be um, lower in the prioritization list. Okay, we got a, we got one uh, question from Bruce Belknap. He's uh, he he works he's 64 and he works at a Home Depot, and he talks about how people come in all the time and they don't social distance even though the signs are up all over the place and everything. Um, what, his question is, why are frontline employees not relegated closer to the front of the line for the vaccine? And I know, I know that at one point in the discussions of, of prior, prioritizing phase two of the, of the rollout, uh, being an essential worker, like in food service, restaurants, whatnot, uh, that, that was a consideration. And then it became not so much a consideration. How, um, so so what, happened, what happened in the planning to take that criteria off the list? So to get um, a vaccine out to as most people as quickly as possible, there are two things. We need to have something very simple to message so the public understands when they can get it, and then simple logistically to pull off. Um, and when we look at our information and the burden of severe disease, it really does depend on age and high risk conditions. Um, and so when we're looking at trying to be efficient as possible and get through all of um, Utahns as quickly as possible, hitting those are at highest risk for hospitalization first. 
um, we decided to go with age and then potentially high risk conditions moving forward um, as criteria. And I, I do want to say that, you know, I think this is the right way to go because it will make a really efficient system. So eventually everybody can get the vaccine sooner rather than having to um, kind of adhere to specific criteria and, and check, you know, are you really an employee? What is an essential worker? Kind of all those details can slow down the process so much that it becomes inefficient. And what we wanna do is make sure we get 70% of our population vaccinated as quickly as possible. That's the end goal. Okay. Um, more, more about the vaccine. Uh, Robert Preddy, one of our readers asked why the rollout's taking so long. And that's, and that's like, that's been a problem everywhere, hasn't it? That, that, yeah, I mean, I would say the beginning was slower than everybody um, would have liked, and that's a national problem. We are picking up so much great momentum here in Utah. I mean, just yesterday we vaccinated 16,000 people. So again, as we're getting the vaccines in the hands of our local health departments who are well equipped for mass vaccination, things are going much quicker. It's opened up to 70 plus now. And like I said, the demand there is off the charts that we're breaking the registration system. So I do anticipate that this momentum is just gonna continue and, and the speed is gonna to continue to pick up. Okay, what, uh, what is, what's the last week and a half been like with Governor Cox in charge? Uh, I mean, it's last Friday's news conference, he seemed really eager to get moving as quickly as possible. What's, what's it feel like from where you are? Yeah, he is definitely a very engaged leader that understands all kind of down to even the, the details of what's going on with the response and what needs to happen moving forward um, and is um, asserting that leadership in a really effective way, especially around vaccines, because we all know that vaccination is our way out of this and, and we can't wait to get there soon enough. Okay, I uh, got a question from Will Sartain. Uh, Will runs the Kilby Court and other music venues. So obviously they've been closed since March and eager to get back. Um, do you feel like we've enlisted enough staff support to dole out enough vaccines to reach 60 to 70% of the population by August? Yeah, so right now our limiting factor is actually just the number of vaccines we're getting. Um, as we get into the spring and more vaccinations become available, um, we do have um, staff surge plans of bringing in staff, for example, from the National Guard, um, from our Medical Reserve Corps, in order to ensure that we can run a seven-day operation and get people vaccinated as quickly as possible. Okay. Benjamin Miller, uh, one of our readers, he said he would do just about anything to get us back to normal, uh, asks if there's a way to volunteer, uh, if there's a way for non-medical professionals to, to vo volunteer in some way to help get the vaccines out. Uh, Joseph Kramer, one of our readers, who's an MD, asks if you need volunteers. Uh, and uh, Patty Holman also asks if, if there's a way to train volunteers to give vaccines. So I would say um, go to your local health department's website and they'll have a medical reserve core um, application and that's how you get started. They're taking applications now um, and um, there's various trainings that are needed right now. So even if you don't have an MD, there's still use for people. So Medical Reserve Corps, you can Google it. It goes through your local health department um, and, and get signed up. Okay, uh, had a couple questions we already covered about the, uh, uh, whether, whether you could still spread the disease if, you, if you've been vaccinated. Um, we had one reader asking if, if uh, hearing the doses might be going to waste uh, and wondering if there's like a wait list or something for vaccines uh, to, to make sure that doesn't happen. But uh, again, that seems to be that you, you've, you found the ones that were left over that, uh, that, and, and be able to move those out to where they need to go. And in our local health department, so um, when people are talking about waste, a lot of times they're thinking of vaccine that has already been thawed. So take, once a vaccine is thawed from the Pfizer dose, you only have about five hours to use it. So if there's a no-show to a vaccination appointment, um, our local health departments actually have a list that they go down and they call people to come in. Um, so, so we do have a way to make sure we're not wasting any doses. Okay, and is is that also does did, did you sometimes get the 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 situation where maybe somebody who works in the office uh, at at a place like this that otherwise might have been phase three, you just say okay, we're going to use it or lose it, so we're going to get those people now. You know, um, from what I hear from our local health departments, they're just going down their list. So if somebody is scheduled for the next day or the next week, they'll give them a call and have them come in earlier and then open up that future spot to somebody else. Okay. Um, Jim Hartley, one of our readers asks, uh, the window to get the second dose, I mean, it's 21 days 
for the for the Pfizer version, it's 28 days from the Moderna. Is there a period where if you wait too long to get the second dose, uh, you won't get full protection or you'll have to start over or anything like that? Again, so this is one of those things we don't know, um, but we do recommend that you just get it as close as you can to that 21 or 28 day window. A couple of weeks late isn't going to make a difference, and that's for sure. Um, but we will learn later kind of what that it's called a catch up schedule would look like. Um, but for now, just get the second dose whenever you can get in and try to get it as close to the 21 or 28 days as possible. Okay. Uh, Courtney Draws asks, if a person gets infected with COVID after their first dose of the vaccine, uh, should they still get the second dose as scheduled? So in order to get the second dose, you should be free from symptoms from COVID, mm -hmm. um, feel good and be out of your isolation period. Um, but we still want you to get your second dose. Okay. Uh, so Tiffany Applebaum asking, trying to separate truth from rumor. She heard her, her mother told her that having COVID doesn't always produce the antibodies, so she doesn't see the point in getting the vaccine. Now, I know it's true. That, I know it's true that some people, when they if they get such a mild case of COVID, that it doesn't produce a lot of antibodies. But the vaccine, for sure, produces plenty of antibodies. Is Absolutely. that right? Absolutely, and that's why we need people who've had COVID to get the vaccine because it's a more sure way. Um, to get protection. Okay. Uh, Brianna Goodale is asking about al allergic reactions. Have, have we seen much about uh, people with allergies uh, to, to COVID uh, or, or know, to, to the vaccine? Yeah, we, we luckily, knock on wood, we haven't really seen a lot of severe reactions here in Utah. Um, okay. We are tracking that on a daily basis. But again, if you've got, if you've had a history of anaphylaxis or severe allergic reaction in the past, um, make sure you have your EpiPen with you, talk with your provider before getting the vaccine. Okay. Are there are there common allergies like you know shellfish or peanuts that that are a warning sign that do people need to look, look, watch out for when they go get their vaccine? Yeah, you know, not that I've heard of because neither one of those ingredients are in um, the the mRNA vaccine, so um, it's unclear what's causing that. Okay. Uh, somebody asks, uh, will the vaccine be safe for women who are pregnant or wanting to become pregnant? So currently the COVID vaccine is recommended for pregnant individuals because pregnancy is one of those high risk conditions for severe disease. Again, we don't have tons of information on the impact of the COVID vaccine on pregnancy. It is thought to be safe. And for example, our pregnant healthcare workers have received it. If it's something you're considering, I encourage you to talk to your healthcare provider so you can get more detail about the risks and benefits there. Okay. And uh, Mandy Allen asks, this is our last vaccine question. Uh, do, uh, do we know when uh, vaccines will be available that'll be safe for under 16? So those studies are going on now, um, okay. hopefully before the fall, but no, right. no timeline. So getting it, we wanna get into testing quickly here. Um, the percentage, the percentage of tests and positive tests has been hovering around 30%. Is there a plan to try to get that number down? Is, is it based on more testing or is it just based on people not getting sick? Um, so that is an indication of how much community spread we have here in Utah. Um, so the way to get it down, it's going to be the same thing I've been saying for a year. Uh, wear a mask, physical distance, stay home when you're sick. That's the way to get it down. Okay. Get your vaccine. I guess I have something new, Sean. Get a vaccine if you can. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Anna asked, why are universities rolling back on mandatory testing and only doing it at the beginning of the semester? So that had to do with um, supply of testing and the ability to get it done. So they are testing everybody within the first 10 days of coming back, which is fantastic. And then they're gonna do random testing throughout the year to find pockets and see if, if they are seeing as much spread. But I really think doing this initial push of testing will help prevent the spread that we saw in the fall. Okay, great. Uh, several readers asked about the B117 variant, the fast spreading version of the coronavirus that was first found in the UK. Uh, it's been spotted in some US states, including our neighbors in, in Colorado. Um, what do we know about the variant and have we seen it in Utah yet? Sure, so um, we, you, uh, you know if you have a variant because you do DNA or whole genome sequencing on the viruses. It's kind of like looking at the DNA makeup of a virus. And we do that in Utah, which is great. Um, we're not able to do it on every single infection, but we do it on um, a good subset of all of our infections and we haven't seen the variant yet. That doesn't mean it's not here. It just means it's not super prevalent. What we know so far is that it does seem to be able to transmit or it's more infectious than the other variants. But I will tell you that that viruses mutate. That's what they do. And 
and the COVID virus has mutated, you know, at least once a week from the beginning of this. Um, and so this isn't unexpected. And the good news is um, it, we have reason to believe that the vaccine is still protective against this new variant. And so it doesn't change our public health practice much other than, you know, mask wearing and physical distancing. It's the same way to protect yourself um, against this variant. Okay. Uh, Kelly Roller asks, uh, do we know what percentage of the population of Utah has already contracted the COVID-19 and have recovered from it? Um, so, you know, we recovered is hard because we know that there's um, long-term symptoms associated with COVID um, and those are followed at the healthcare system or provider level. Um, we as a state health department don't follow individuals long enough to understand all of that. Um, that's why we work with our healthcare system partners. Um, you know, so I guess in short answer, no, but we do have that recovered definition on our website that says, you know, people who are are three weeks out from their infection and, and haven't passed away as a very, very crude metric. But time will tell when we're able to look at all of our data in retrospect on, on how many people actually have long-term effects or don't. Okay, um, this la last question, uh, and anybody who's been paying attention knows the answer already. Uh, somebody named Dirk, just Dirk, uh, asked, are you single? Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> And we, I mean, if, if, we've, if you've seen your, if you've seen your uh, uh, Twitter feed during Christmas when you and your family were all in your matching pajamas, uh, that, that yeah. answer, that answer speaks for itself. Um, so I just wanted to say to Dirk, uh, better luck next <laughs> pandemic, I suppose. Uh, Dirk might be my husband. He's just using a pseudonym. Oh, okay. I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. I did want to finish with this, though. The Janie Bennett, one of our readers, Janie didn't have a question. All she wanted to say was, quote, just thank you for being a good parent to Utah, smart, respectful, brave, consistent, and trustworthy. I hold you in the highest regard. So that's thank from Janie you. No, to you. No, no place I'd rather be right now during a pandemic. Utah's fantastic. So oh, that's cool. Uh, and really, OK, that boy, that went by fast. Uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, we covered a lot of ground in 30 minutes. Uh, Dr. Angela Dunn, I want to thank you for, for helping us out and, and uh, getting a lot of our readers' uh, questions answered. Uh, thanks for your time, and thank, and thank you for helping our readers understand all this. Thank you for the opportunity. Talk to you later, Sean. All right, talk to you later. And thank you all for watching. For the Salt Lake Tribune, I'm Sean Means.